Ugh, I don't feel like teaching today. So, uh, here's some old content. Hello and welcome to yet another Game Boy video. I'm Jamie, this is Stuff We Play, and I've been on a bit of a Game Boy kick lately. And I think that's good because according to my YouTube analytics, y'all have really been enjoying the Game Boy content. So today I figured, why not grab my original Game Boy, yes there's a Game Boy inside this bigger Game Boy, and look at the original launch titles from back in 1989. There are six of these coming from across the world, with five being released in America and one being released in not America. Now yeah, I know these probably seem more basic than what a lot of people think when they hear the term Game Boy. Well, not counting Tetris, anyway. And that's fair, I mean, nothing here is as complex as a Donkey Kong 94 or a Pokemon Yellow or a Mega Man V or anything like that. These games are from the Game Boy's earliest days in 1989. I know that's pretty obvious, Wikipedia could have told you that, but it's still worth saying just for context. These games are all being ranked as well. I feel like number-based scores don't really say much of anything worthwhile about a game's quality, so today I'm going to just compare them all to each other. I'm trying to come at these games both from a modern point of view while also considering which ones I'd actually buy if I saw them on a store shelf, and there's really not that much out there as far as portable gaming went. I mean damn, it was 1989, what else would I have bought? An Atari Lynx? So today on Stuff We Play, let's play and rank all six of the original Game Boy's launch titles. The first game up today is Alleyway. I first played this one when it launched in the 3DS eShop because, well, I don't know, I guess I just had a few bucks to waste. It's a really basic breakout clone. Use a panel at the bottom of the screen to bounce a ball around and break blocks. Sometimes the blocks will scroll around, sometimes more blocks will come down from the top of the screen, and sometimes you'll reach a bonus level, which features Mario. And something I noticed in a few different Nintendo titles from this era, Random Marios. It's kind of charming. Personally, in 2022, I'd rather go back and play one of the Arkanoid titles if I was craving playing a game like this. At least that one had power-ups and stuff. Alleyway isn't bad, just basic. There isn't even any music in most of the game. But also, it's a fitting place to start off today. It's truly a middle-of-the-road title when it comes to quality. There's something oddly charming about sports games from the 80s. No league licenses, no real-life players on the covers, nothing really at all to really entice someone browsing a bunch of games on a shelf, but I don't mean that in a bad way. There's something weirdly nice about that. Oh, you like baseball? And you have a Game Boy? Well damn, here's baseball on the Game Boy. It's about as basic of a baseball game as you can get, but it's not like you're expecting anything more than a basic baseball game with a title like, well, Baseball. And before I get some complaints in the comments, I'm not ragging on these games for being basic. I mean, damn, they're Game Boy launch titles. I even think it could be argued that, Game Boy hardware limitations aside, these games were always intended to be basic. The original Game Boy was Nintendo's first dedicated handheld console. You know, one that could actually play games off cartridges and use a standardized button layout. Game & Watch be damned. Basic games that are decently fun in short bursts and are overall passable were a great way to show that, though they were all black and white, well, I guess green and black more accurately, these games were just as playable as their bigger counterparts on the then still very relevant NES. Now granted, I'm pretty certain that even in 1989 you could find a more impressive baseball game than this in the NES. Game Boy Baseball is really simple. Select a team and then alternate between pitching and batting until the game ends or you get bored and shut it off. Yeah, this one moves pretty slowly. And I say that as a lifelong baseball fan, or I was anyways until it was revealed that the Astros were a bunch of fucking cheaters. Baseball can be snappy at times. Hitting a home run is incredibly satisfying, especially when you get to watch your ball sail into the stands. But fielding is just so jank. The AI might hit a ball into the field and you may think you're running towards it only for the game to switch which player you're controlling for you to suddenly be running in the opposite direction from the ball with a different player. And of course, the AI doesn't have any trouble with that stuff. So, uh, 
GG to them, I guess. Earlier in 1989, one of the NES's greatest baseball games was released, SNK's Baseball Stars. I know that was followed up by some truly incredible sequels on the Neo Geo hardware. If you're craving some 8-bit baseball, like actual, authentic 8-bit baseball, the NES version of Baseball Stars is easily one of the best. As for Game Boy Baseball here, well, I'll rank it above Alleyway, just because it has more to offer, but not by much. Damn, another sports game, okay. Thankfully, there are only two of these, which is good because unlike baseball, I was never really big on tennis in real life. There's nothing particularly wrong with the game itself for me. Tennis just never grabbed me in the same way baseball did. Maybe it's because I've never lived anywhere with some easily accessible tennis courts, but played a hell of a lot of street baseball as a kid. Anyways, this is tennis. Once again, yes, that's literally the title. It's another basic sports game, but despite what I just said about the sport of tennis itself, I'd argue that Game Boy Tennis is actually a bit more fun than Game Boy Baseball. There's a couple of different serves, which player is serving switches off after each round. Is it even the determined tennis round? Oh, and Mario's the referee. Basic, yet charming. There's also a two-player mode, because yeah, the link cable launched with the Game Boy. It's funny to think about that for me, uh, you know, for the longest time I just assumed the link cable wasn't even really a thing until Pokemon. The only other major thing of note here is that tennis wasn't released at launch in Europe, not even in the UK, which is funny as I know Wimbledon is kind of a big deal over there, but they weren't missing much. That's Game Boy Tennis. It's basic, yet solid. Easy to move around, really fun when you get into a nice groove of hitting the ball back and forth. This one is a good bit of fun and light bursts. I mean, it's no Wii Sports Tennis, but it's good enough that I'll place it above baseball. Huh, so much for Alleyway just being middle of the road. I promise that one's not that bad. Tetris is the reason a lot of people bought Game Boys. You don't need me to explain Tetris because this line-clearing puzzle game is so iconic. If you've never played Tetris in some way, shape, or form, please stop lying. So what's there to say about Game Boy Tetris that hasn't been said a million times before? Somehow Nintendo ended up being able to do a first-party Tetris release after shenanigans involving Atari and the NES. And this Game Boy version is definitely a bit more rock-solid than Nintendo's version of the NES, which was already a really solid puzzler. Three music tracks, with a line clear mode and a general high score mode, some nice references to the now former Soviet Union. Yeah, it's easy to see why this one took off. The only handheld system my sister ever owned was her original Game Boy. She bought it back in the early 90s and kept it... Well, if I remember right, she kept it until a few years back when she sold it off. And the only game I ever remember seeing her play is Tetris. And I think that went for a lot of folks. It's a fun, addicting game that's really good to play in short bursts, and especially so while on the shitter. This one easily takes the top spot so far. I mean, damn, it was bundled with a ton of Game Boys. It's the Wii Sports of the Game Boy, as in you could have bought a Game Boy that was bundled with Tetris, never bought anything else for it, and still felt really satisfied with your purchase. I was getting pretty bored at looking at black and white gameplay, so I decided to play this one using the Game Boy Color Color Palette. Gotta love the Retro Freak. And if you'd want to see me do a video like this for the Game Boy Color or Game Boy Advance launch titles, or any other system really, I even did a video like this a few years back for all the PlayStation consoles, then just let me know in the comments below. So, this is the one non-Tetris Game Boy launch title I still come back to on occasion. Super Mario Land. And like Alleyway, I first played it on the 3DS. And unlike Alleyway, I found myself coming back to it again and again and again. Shigeru Miyamoto, who as he said himself is Mario's dad, had nothing to do with this one. Instead, Mario Land was directed by Satoru Okada, who's perhaps best known for directing the likes of Metroid and Kid Icarus. And yeah, that shows. Even by Mario standards, this game is weird. You know how in the original Super Mario Bros. Mario has a kind of momentum to him? If you stop running, he won't stop immediately, but will instead briefly slow down. Yeah, Mario Land isn't like that. If you aren't pressing a direction while in the air, you'll drop like a rock. And if you stop running, you stop on a dime. But physics jank isn't all this one has on offer. 
Mario's iconic Fire Flower ability is missing, instead you have the Super Ball. Think of a Fire Flower shot that can ricochet off walls and even collect coins for you. Instead of flagpoles, levels have two exits. If you take the top exit, which, oh, I know, the horror may require platforming, you'll get to play a little mini game where you can win extra lives or a power up. There's no Bowser or Princess Peach here either. Instead, we have Daisy in her first ever Mario series appearance and, uh, this thing. It squeals like a dying goat when you shoot it, and really, that's the only thing of note about it. A couple of the stages are full on shoot 'em ups, and I kind of wish there were more of these because they're really fun. Mario Land itself is already very short. I personally beat it when recording this gameplay here in around 20 minutes. There are four worlds with three levels each, and of those 12 total levels, only two of them are the shooters. Still, fun times. I really like how unique all of the worlds feel. It's like Mario's going on a trip around the world, and this is also reflected in the excellent soundtrack. Eastern Asia, Easter Island, Egypt, and uh, well that's basically it, isn't it? Apparently Mario's getting around a UFO as well. Nice. Take that, Mario Odyssey. Mario Land did it first. The music also had that nice early Game Boy twang to it. I don't know how quite to describe it, but a lot of early Game Boy game music has a sort of tinniness that isn't ear grating, but more so sounds like it's gone in most later releases. I find it really charming. It really helps me differentiate early Game Boy games from later ones. Compare music from Mario Land and Tetris, and even something like, say, Solar Striker, which came out in 1990, something like Mega Man 5, or even the original Pokemon games. Do you hear it? I hope that makes sense. Mario Land, for all its roughness, is still a lot of fun today. And don't get me wrong, there's definitely some roughness there. I've definitely phased through platforms more times than I'd like to admit. But it still has a lot of charm, and thanks in part to a short link, it's incredibly replayable. By the way, I don't know where else to put this, so here it is. But there's actually a full-color ROM hack called Super Mario Land DX. It ports Mario Land to the Game Boy Color in much the same way Zelda Link's Awakening later was. And yeah, it's pretty good. It's Mario Land in full color with bigger sprites, and it's pretty dang rad. With all of that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and crown Mario Land the best of the Game Boy launch titles. Behind Tetris, of course. Ah, it's Tetris. It's just so addicting. But wait, there's one more Game Boy launch game left. This is a title called Yakuman, and it was only released in Japan. What type of adventure is it? Is it going to blow Mario Land and Tetris out of the water? And what were we in North America missing out on? Oh, it's Mahjong. Yeah. With games like Super Mario Bros. now in color, you might actually forget where you are. Time for the bonus round. This footage is from an official tech demo for the Game Boy Color. Released by Nintendo to various shops in 1998, the same year the GBC came out, it's actually pretty impressive. There's some basic 3D on display, albeit some of it is in a cut segment. There's gameplay from multiple big name titles, namely Zelda Link's Awakening DX, Tetris DX, and Wario Land 2. And actually, Wario Land 2 is a big deal here, for a few reasons. First off, this demo cartridge itself is actually just an officially made ROM hack of Wario Land 2. A way extensive one at that. Really impressive work here, it's so cool to see Nintendo as pro ROM hacking as ever, am I right? But second off, Wario Land 2 itself was a launch title. Hi, it's me, New Office Jamie. Welcome to yet another Stuff We Play Game Boy thing. I've been feeling a little creative itch while moving house, so while I figure out how to make my office look like a bit less of a horrifying mess, that's what I keep glancing around at, I decided to get back to making videos because I need something to help take my mind off... this. So speaking of videos, here's a look at the Game Boy Color launch titles. After I did my look back at the original Game Boy launch titles a couple of months ago, I wasn't sure if I wanted to cover the GBC or not, as there were only a grand total of four games at launch in North America. 
However, I soon learned that there were four additional launch titles that were released only in Japan. I'll know what major regions each of these are from as we go through, so uh, yeah, let's jump right into it. America, the beautiful Game Boy Color. Get into it. To start, here's Pocket Bomberman. I think it's one of the oddest titles for the GBC period. Bomberman is a well-known series of overhead party games where you drop bombs and collect power-ups to try to kill your friends without blowing yourself up in the process. If this guy looks familiar, you may recognize him from Bomberman Act Zero for the Xbox 360 or untitled Bomberman game for Apple Arcade. Classic. Pocket Bomberman is surprisingly not an overhead action game. I mean, there were traditional Bomberman games on the Game Boy, and I guess those could technically be Pocket Bomberman games if you played them on a Game Boy Pocket, but that's besides the point. By 1998, there had been both a Bomberman GB1 and 2 for the original Game Boy. So I guess the folks over at Hudson Soft wanted something a bit different for this outing. Pocket Bomberman is a 2D platformer. Like in the traditional games, you play as the titular Bomberman as you lay bombs and gather power-ups throughout each stage to power up your abilities. Instead of being multiplayer madness driven, it's more centric on a single player mode where you go through stages killing enemies to unlock doors. At the end of every few levels, there's a boss and the whole experience is actually really fun. There's a lot of strategy involved. Some enemies require precision bomb drops, some jumps require you to lay bombs and use them as makeshift platforms, and granted, sometimes you can get stuck in a stage. I had it happen a few times. But your limitless supplies of bombs means that restarting is no problem, and the bite-sized nature of each level means that Pocket Bomberman is really a lot of fun on the go. It also features a really nice color palette, which is good because, you know, color was the whole main selling point of the Game Boy color, and I'm sure it popped on the non-backlit Game Boy Color screen, but Grandy, you could in theory play it on a Game Boy with a lit screen back in the day, as by the time this game released, the nicely lit Game Boy Light was out in Japan. Now that was an original Game Boy variant, but this was a black cartridge Game Boy Color game, meaning that despite being made with the color in mind, it could still be played on old school Game Boy models in a black and white mode. What's really weird about the Game Boy Color version of Pocket Bomberman is that it was strictly a North American and European release. There had been an earlier release in Japan, but this was strictly a black and white version for the original Game Boy line. No clue why it didn't get a re-release over there as Pocket Bomberman DX or whatever. I mean, if there's one thing Nintendo loves, it's folks releasing old games as new releases on new platforms. To start though, this one is pretty solid. Oh look, Centipede! Speaking of black and white Game Boy games getting color re-releases, this is Centipede from Accolade. Like Pocket Bomberman, it's a black cartridge game, so in theory you could have a regular Game Boy and a Game Boy copy of Centipede and literally buy the same game twice if you bought this version. Centipede itself is an early arcade shooter, like seriously early. The original arcade game came out all the way back in 1981. You play a small bug thing with a gun as you shoot the segments of a centipede. The difficulty ramps up pretty quickly through the levels, but I mean, it is an arcade game. That all comes with the territory. It's not bad at all. The only other thing of note is that this was a strictly European and US release as well. And as far as ranking goes, I'll go ahead and place it below Pocket Bomberman for sure. Now let's look at Game & Watch Gallery 2. This one's a pretty cool addition. Nintendo's first handheld game systems, if you'd even call them that since they were so basic, were the Game & Watch line. These were little LCD games featuring simple premises. Keep people from falling by propping up manhole covers, steal the treasure from an octopus without getting snared in its tentacles, uh, juggle balls. Honestly, think of those old Tiger LCD games except... good? Remaking and re-releasing them on the Game Boy then was probably a no-brainer. The first Game & Watch Gallery title was a pretty nice little collection featuring several classic games in a near-original form. However, along with the originals, the first Game & Watch Gallery game also featured remakes of the include titles featuring Mario characters. It was only natural then that I'd get a sequel, and over the years it actually got three of them. With the first being 1997's Game & Watch Gallery 2. Yeah, the original Japanese version from 97 was just a standard black and white Game Boy game, but it did get some minor color updates so it could be released as a black cartridge game at the Game Boy Color's launch. I'm actually playing it here via the Super Game Boy for the SNES, as I think these borders you get while playing it there are really cool and just add to the experience. It gives it that je ne sais quoi. 
There are six Game & Watch games this time around compared to the original's four, and they all include classic and modern versions, along with different difficulties and Mario characters in those modern versions. The games here are Parachute, Helmet, Chef, Vermin, Donkey Kong, and Ball. They're all simple and I feel like just viewing a bit of each gets the point across. Though, if not, I'd be down to do a whole video on this series or even Game & Watches in general if there's a demand. My favorite of them is definitely the Game & Watch version of Donkey Kong. It's a bit more fast paced than the original arcade and NES game, featuring Mario swinging on chains and flipping switches to save Peach from the titular Angry Ape. Good stuff. Really, if you were a fan of Game & Watch stuff or just wanted something that was easy to play in short bursts on the go, you'd be pretty happy with this one. It's not a super complex game, but still one I would have been happy with at launch. I'll put it right below Pocket Bomberman in the rankings. Here is Hexite. It's a Ubisoft game that, despite coming out everywhere, seems to have just been a launch title in Japan. And guess what? Like every other game we're talking about today, it's a black cartridge game. Yeah, okay, you've probably noticed this trend already, but none of the launch games anywhere in the world for the GBC were exclusive to the platform. I'm surprised there wasn't even one clear cartridge game. Like, if you were an original Game Boy owner, would some additional color in your games be worth it to get a brand new system with no true exclusives at launch? Like, damn, this thing didn't even have a backlight. Anyways, Hexite is kind of like Blockus if you've ever played that. You're presented a board with hexagons and a set number of shaped pieces, and then you take turns with an opponent to try to fill the board and complete hexagons before they do. If the entire board gets filled and you have pieces left over, you get points deducted from your total based on a type and number of pieces, and as far as placing pieces goes, they have to touch the edges with pieces already on the board. It's simple, yet addictive and even on easier settings against an AI, I'm really bad at it apparently. The AI was routinely kicking my ass. Maybe I'm just really bad with shapes. Regardless, the game is fun, and I'd imagine it'd be doubly so with a friend, via Link Cable of course. Yeah, even though the GBC's infrared features were advertised a good bit, they were hardly ever actually used, but that's a topic I've already covered. Twice. Hexide is pretty fun though, and if you ever find a copy, it's dirt cheap nowadays. With luck, you'll be a good bit better at it than I was. I'll go ahead and place this one right below Game & Watch Gallery 2. This is Pocket Bowling. It only came out in Japan at launch, and can you guess what sport this is based around? You choose one of several characters, I usually went for this penguin, the only decent choice really, and then you go, well, bowling. It's certainly no Wii Sports, is it? I found after a bit that if I kept roughly the same time and named the ball just off-center to the left, I could guarantee a striker spare. The game tries to be cool and has a tournament mode in it, but despite showing you going to different bowling alleys, the backgrounds never change much and never see your opponent's bowling. It kind of sucks, actually. Scratch that, it really sucks. I know I'm just trying to give a basic overview of each game, but Tetris DX is just, well, Tetris, but in color. I mean, golf played Tetris, right? Well, okay, maybe that's not totally fair. I mean, this one includes, for example, a 40 line mode where you try to clear 40 lines as fast as possible. And there's also some new cutscenes and even some new music tracks that didn't appear in the original. I just couldn't help but expect a bit more. When I first saw Tetris DX on store shelves back in the day, I was expecting a case of a Tetris game that had nothing to do with the original. Something like Tetris Attack or Tetris 2, you know? But as far as Tetris goes, Tetris DX is a good Tetris. To be fair, the original Game Boy Tetris was already a good Tetris. You like Tetris? Here's more Tetris. Get out of my game store. I'll go ahead and rank it right below Pocket Bomberman. That game might not feel as polished, but while Tetris DX is a solid offering, it doesn't bring much new to the table. This is Dragon Warrior Monsters. Well, specifically, this should be Dragon Quest Monsters, because Dragon Warrior was called Dragon Quest in Japan, and this game was only a launch title in Japan. It eventually got an American release. I watched a Let's Play of it back in high school, and it was pretty rad. The, the, the point is, I was trying to be clever there. As was emphasized a ton in that Pokemon documentary I released a month back, Pokemon was a huge deal in the late 90s. And with a series of games so popular it became a target for evangelicals everywhere. This is Misty. She's headstrong and stubborn, constantly arguing with Ash. Typical woman. Came Pokemon clones. Robopon, Fighting Foodons, how even Monster Rancher were all originally made to capitalize on Pokemania. 
Enter Enix and their flagship series, Dragon Quest, or Dragon Warrior as we used to call it over here back in the day. This was the original console JRPG series, with its releases on the original Famicom being so popular that there used to be major issues in Japan with folks skipping work in school to play the newest Dragon Quest games when they came out. And honestly, good on them, slash those slimes. DQ Monsters here is Enix not only capitalizing on Pokemania, but doing a truly Dragon Quest-esque spin on it. The battle system is similar to older DQ titles, being from the back, as is the overworld you explore. The main difference from regular Dragon Quest is that after each battle, one of the monsters you defeated has a chance to request to join your party. You can have up to three monsters in your party at a time, and if you exceed this, you can send them to a nice farm upstate. Story-wise, you play as a kid named Terry whose sister gets kidnapped by a monster taken through a wardrobe to the magical kingdom of Great Tree. You fall in pursuit and meet the king, who assigns you the task of becoming a polka, I mean monster master. Wow. From there, it's standard RPG fare of exploring dungeons, finding new creatures, beating bosses, and hopefully saving your sister. There are 215 of these monsters to collect, and a lot of them will even talk with you. Now, there is some jank here. Want to manage your items in the overworld? While you don't press start to bring up the menu, that would make too much sense. You select. Also, did one of your monsters faint? Well, if you don't immediately revive it, you'll be stuck lugging its literal coffin around the map with you until you reach a spot where you can heal it. DQ Monsters does not fuck around. Another black cartridge game, DQW, was only released at launch in Japan. It took until 2000 to get a release overseas, but it clearly did well enough. There were sequel titles, a manga accompaniment, and three different remakes, all of which were Japanese exclusive. Probably the coolest of these is Dragon Quest Monsters Terry's Wonderland 3D for the 3DS. Along with being all in, well, 3D, it ups the monster number to a staggering 600 and some. That includes addition of tons of monsters from future Dragon Quest Monsters games, full 3D models and worlds to explore, and of course, all the fun stuff like arena battles and metal collection from the original. None of this DQW remake stuff has come stateside though. There has even been a 3DS eShop release over here of the GBC version, and that's a shame. If you have a Game Boy Color, or you know, other means of playing retro games, then Dragon Warrior Monsters is a must play. It's at the top of the list so far and is easily one of the best games on the Game Boy Color. Indeed, it's my second favorite that I've talked about today. Bringing it back to the beginning, let's talk about Mario Land 2. Now, I have a whole ass rant planned about this game. You're a captive audience now. You've watched this far. Please listen to me info dump about this game from the year I was born. So how many Wario Land games do you think there are? Never heard of the series? Here's a refresher. Wario Land 2 came out for the original Game Boy in 1998. That same year in Japan though, it also had a black cart Game Boy Color version released the same day as the GBC itself. So that's two versions of the same game that can be played on the same system. Maybe that's why they called it Wario Land 2, because there were two versions of the same game, right? So this was followed by Wario Land 3 in 2000, which was in fact a clear cartridge game, exclusive to the Game Boy Color. Then, a year later, around the time the Game Boy Advance launched, there was Wario Land 4, and that was the last numbered entry. But wait, does Wario Land shake it for the Wii count? I mean, that one was on a home console and came out in 08 and doesn't have a number, but it has the Wario Land name, damn it! And what about Wario World on the GameCube? And according to Wikipedia, Wario Master of Disguise for the DS is a Wario Land game. And what was the first ever Wario Land game? I mean, if we're going strictly off that name, Wario Land, the only game to bear that title exactly was Wario Land for the Virtual Boy. That's actually a really great game, by the way. Yeah, there is actually a great game on the Virtual Boy, a whole one of them. But as it turns out, that was not Wario Land 1. No, the actual first Wario Land game was Wario Land Super Mario Land 3 for the original Game Boy. So, does that make the original two Mario Land games part of the Wario Land series? Maybe just Mario Land 2, since Wario was the big bad there, but Wario didn't exist when Mario Land 1 was made and it had its own weird big bad? You know what? You decide. Let me know in the comments. I've gotten way off track from the game I'm supposed to be focusing on here. Wario Land 2 for the Game Boy Color. This one is an incredibly solid platformer. 
Play as Wario as you go through stages, stomping and charging through enemies, collecting all the riches you can along the way. I love how wildly creative it can get. See this crusher section? Getting smashed by one will kill you and make you lose a life or something, right? Well, wrong! Oh, flatten Wario, letting you traverse certain narrow paths. It's this type of creativity that permeates through every bit of this game. From the level designs, to the enemies, to the bosses that can literally toss you out of their arenas, throughout the entire adventure, it's just an absolute blast. Track it down, give it a play, it's by far my favorite of the launch titles. And unlike DQW, this one is on 3DS. And thanks to Nintendo's excellent grasp of business and preservation, it will likely remain a viable way to play this one for years to come, especially with likely ports of the Wario Land series also sure to come to the Switch, right? <laughs> thanks Nintendo, I really needed some good news right now. Welcome to Stuff We Play, where today I have a huge mysterious box on my desk. Yeah, this video is about Game Boy Advance launch titles, but I want to start off by talking about the Play It Forward box. And yes, this is going to be a long video, especially compared to the other Game Boy vids which I've done, which had launch title numbers in the single digits. The GBA here has, so far as I can tell, 36. And this encompasses the US, Canada, Europe, and Japan. For all I know, I may have missed one or two in Brazil or something. Anyways, and I promise this has something to do with the video proper, let's talk about the Play It Forward box. This was started last year by Do You Nerd, and is basically a traveling little free library of video game goodies. This was sent to me by my good friends G Next Level and Ranchan, and before the box passed through their hands, had gone through fellow content creators such as Gamer Aimer, Biddy Kong's Quest, and John Riggs. Now that's passed through my hands, by the way, I'm sending it on to my good friend Johnny, and don't worry, there is a monkey ball item in there for them, but it's up to them if they want to show that off or not. Basically, the idea here is take a few items leave a few items, sign the guest book, and pass it on. Though you can take or leave as much as you'd like, I made a point of leaving more items I took. However, I did grab some great goodies. In fact, I made sure to grab one of every single patch, pen, and business card left by other creators, my favorite being the ones from Game Dad here. Putting a scannable QR code on a uniquely shaped business card is an idea that I am definitely considering stealing. <laughs> as for gaming items, first I picked up Love Letter, which is a tabletop game that comes with this really nice red bag. Always love more tabletop games, I've really been getting into them lately. I blame watching After School Dice Club. I also picked up a 1UP card, which will be fantastic fantastic for cleaning some cartridges, and a copy of both Cubix for PS1 and a PlayStation Underground disc. I don't know what it is, but even though I've really slowed down with game collecting, there's something about demo discs that I just really love. I also grabbed a foldable charging stand for the Nintendo Switch, and a sealed copy of Atari Flashback Volume 2 for PS4. Formerly sealed now. The final and coolest item I grabbed was this Game Shark for the Game Boy Color. I really want to show this off sometime, perhaps along with this Monster Brain thing I got for the GBC a while back as well, but that's for a different video. Notable for this vid though is what's attached to the back of the Game Shark, or front. I can't really tell what side this is supposed to be, but anyways, it's Super Monkey Ball Jr. But wait, I might hear you say, Super Monkey Ball Jr. came out in 2002, and the Game Boy Advance came out in 2001. That means it's not a launch title, and to that I say, you're right. However, fun fact, Super Monkey Ball Jr. was the first portable video game I ever owned, and if you're watching this on YouTube and don't care, hey, there's timestamps in the description. Back to Monkey Ball, sure, I'd play Game Boy games beforehand on systems belonging to others, but the first handheld I ever owned was this Game Boy Advance SP that, oh god, I forget if I got it for Christmas 2004 or my birthday in 05. That's kind of the problem with having a January 7th birthday. But with this system, I got two games. One was Monkey Ball Jr., and the other was a video game adaptation of the Jim Carrey version of a series of unfortunate events. And that one sucked and I barely played it, so let's just call Monkey Ball Jr. my first. Super Monkey Ball Jr. is a portable version of the original Monkey Ball games, featuring some seemingly original stages, four different mini-games, and four different playable monkeys. My favorite is Mimi. There's three different main difficulties with different stages in each, and a special EX mode you can lock for being really damn good at abusing apes. For this, the Game Boy game I'd played the most with a cousin's copy of Pokemon Silver. So look at that, and now look at this. This is really rudimentary rough 3D, sure, but my god, it's on the GBA. 
and this was the first GBA game I'd ever actually owned at that. I'm still kind of impressed by it. Now, MBJ here is not without its jank. Monkey Ball, whether being played on the GameCube or in the arcade using one of those sweet, sweet banana joysticks, is meant to have a wide range of precise movement. Guiding monkeys through these tilting mazes is a little more difficult when all you have is a D-pad. The game tries to compensate for this by making your acceleration a little slow by default, with your speed increasing quickly if you hold down the A button. It's an imperfect fix, but for the most part, it works. The mini games are fun too. Come see me and I'll kick your ass at Monkey Fight any day of the week. But it's okay, because uh, even nearly 20 years later, I still suck ass at Monkey Golf and Monkey Bowling. I know this is a rather polarizing game among Monkey Ball fans, and in a world where Banana Mania exists, there's no real reason to come back to it. But even if this is just the nostalgia talking, I found a lot to love here. I still think this is a decent Monkey Ball game, and a graphically technically impressive GBA game on top of that. Now we're about to get into the actual GBA launch titles now, but before we do, I want to demonstrate how we're going to do things going forward. To start, when I introduce a game, these flags will appear on the bottom of the screen. Whatever flags appear show all the regions the game in question was released in. If for some reason a game was released in a region but not at launch, its flag will still be displayed, but grayed out. Also at the end, I'll give the game one of three ratings, just to keep this quick and simple. A thumbs up of a like it, a thumbs down if I don't, or a general meh if I either find it completely uninteresting or just don't really understand it. I usually try not to distill my opinions just down to ratings, but with how rapid fire this vid is, it feels kind of necessary here. The GBA's global launch dates are, by the way, the 21st of March 2001 in Japan, the 11th of June 2001 in the US and Canada, and the 22nd of June 2001 in most PAL territories. I'm not exactly sure on where else in the world it got released and when, but it did apparently get a release in China in 2004 according to Wikipedia, though that date needs a citation. Oh, and one last thing before we go. Monkey Ball Jr. gets a thumbs up. Might not have been a launch title, but I'm certainly glad it was my first. I couldn't decide if I wanted to do these games region by region, alphabetically, or by some way by genre, so ultimately I just took all 36 names and threw them in a blender, meaning I'm going in a basically randomized order for the rest of this video. Anyways, this is Kuru Kuru Kururin. My god, I probably butchered that name. This is a puzzle game where you try to take control of a spinning helicopter thing, piloted by this little bird guy, and have to steer it through a maze without hitting any walls. Think of Irritating Stick if you've ever played that one. Now, unlike a lot of puzzle games like this, you do have multiple hit points. There are heart sections scattered around each stage which will restore you to max health, along with springs that change the direction you're rotating, not to mention a variety of power-ups. It's a cute game where you're off to rescue your bird siblings, I guess, and it has this really nice cartoony art style, and it's way easy to pick up, too. However, it doesn't stay easy for long. This game will kick you in the nuts and laugh at you, and inexplicably, you'll keep crawling back for more. Which I mean, I, I guess is the mark of any good puzzle game. And nothing really changes from world to world save for the backgrounds, and, and like some of them are out there, but yeah, just look at this one. This sun is giving me some really creepy vibes. Oh, and in the Star World, I thought these little squares were just background pieces at first, and uh, my god, I was wrong. But yeah, presentation graphically and sound-wise is good. The game is hard, but I mean that's a good thing here, because it's easy to dive into, but hard to master. It's a shame it never got a North American release, as I think I would have absolutely loved this one as a kid. It also got two sequels, one also on the GBA and another on the GameCube, and those unfortunately never left Japan. As for this first game, while it's not winning any Game of the Year awards, it's a great new IP that I think you should definitely consider checking out, even nowadays. It's an easy thumbs up from me. Army Men Advance is a game by the 3DO company. If that name sounds familiar, it's because back in the 90s, under the leadership of EA founder Trip Hawkins, they developed a line of video game console hardware called, well, the 3DO. The 3DO systems were very powerful for the time and manufactured by a whole variety of different companies, and even had some neat quirks such as daisy chainable controllers. But they also cost nearly 700 US dollars at launch, not to mention a slew of reliability problems. Truly the Tesla of video game consoles. After the 3DO, the console flopped. 3DO, the company, went to developing games for other platforms as a third-party developer. Well, I mean, they did have a system called the M2 in the works at one point, but nothing ever came of that. 
Their flagship series became the Army Men games, which are based on those little green plastic soldier toys I'm sure a bunch of you got at some point as a kid. These games are everywhere from the N64 to PCs to the Game Boy Color, and the series is even somewhat around today with a mobile game coming out a few years back. As for this GBA entry, it's really nothing special. It's an overhead shooter that almost feels like it's begging to be twin stick, like a poor man's Smash TV or Xeno Crisis. Your green soldiers are at war with the tan ones, so take control of this green dude or this girl as you go fight for everlasting peace or whatever. I know it probably doesn't seem like I'm very interested in this one, but I mean, it doesn't give me a lot to go off of. You fire at a weird angle, but it's okay because half the time I manage to hit enemies without even aiming. If I get close enough, I could just beat army dudes up using the butt of my gun, so I guess that's something. Also, why are my bullets green? What are they? Paintballs? The stages are vast and empty, and the graphics can't seem to decide how cartoonish they want to go. Sometimes I found myself just running around waiting for something to happen. Either I'm flipping switches, or I'm mindlessly firing at enemies, or I have stuff like in the second stage where I need to destroy all these armored vehicles, but this tank outright wouldn't spawn for a good several minutes, and I, I honestly have no idea what triggered this. Perhaps the cherry on top of this shit Sunday is outside of the title screen, there's no music. Besides some really compressed sounding gunshots and some soldier grunts, you're playing in silence. Honestly, if I'd gotten this one with my GBA, I probably would have gotten really bored of it way quickly, and maybe even not spent as much time with the system as they ultimately did. I was six when I got my GBA, and six-year-olds famously have ridiculously short attention spans, and last I checked, waiting around a bunch ain't good for that. This game gets a thumbs down from me. I am an air traffic controller. That, that's the name of the game. I, I work in marketing and writing IRL. But this game here, Boku Wako Kin Kansaiken, sorry about butchering that, I don't speak Japanese, it roughly translates to I am an air traffic controller. Japan is all about these arcade simulator-esque games. Densha de go anyone? I am an air traffic controller is part of a series that originally released in 1998 for Japanese PC. And from there it then saw ports and sequels for every platform under the sun, and that includes this GBA version here. The point of the game is pretty simple. You work in one of the world's most stressful jobs at one of Japan's many airports. It's up to you to single-handedly coordinate flight takeoffs, landings, and just generally keep air traffic moving without planes crashing into each other, or delays getting to such a point that even United would find them unacceptable. I was initially worried about playing this one as, well, I don't read or speak Japanese. However, after pushing through a few minutes of tutorials, I really started to get it. See these three lines? These are your flight paths. The blue is where planes approach from, the green is where planes circle before landing, and the red is where planes go down to land. If I could change one thing, I wish you could preset commands. See, every time you want to do something, you have to put in a command, listen to some remarkably high quality sounding dialogue, and then you can put in another. But that's not to say I didn't have a lot of fun here, despite the odd pacing. I mean, I'm bad at it, real bad, but it gets pretty hectic pretty quickly and no matter how many times I ran out of time or accidentally crashed some planes, I found myself coming back for more. Also, all of the spoken dialogue is in English, which I guess makes sense as for the sake of standardization that's typically what is actually done in most of the world of commercial aviation, no joke. As much as I enjoyed this, I know not everyone will have the patience to fumble through Japanese text and get to the good part, but I'm still going to give this one a thumbs up as I feel that is still very possible. Like with Densha to Go, I don't know why this one was never released stateside, though there was a later DS entry in the series that came over to North America as Air Traffic Chaos. While I haven't played much of that one, GameSpot did give it the most surprisingly good Game of the Year award in 2008. Honestly, as someone who has never once felt interested in air traffic control before, this I think is an accolade this GBA game deserves as well. Well, I mean, for 2001, not 2008, but the point is, the game's good and deserves a thumbs up as well. What a horrible night to have a curse. So here's the first proper launch game from a series you've actually played. This is Castlevania Circle of the Moon, the first of a whole bunch of side-scrolling Castlevania games released during the GBA and Nintendo DS eras. During this time, most home console Castlevanias tried to bring the series into 3D with varying degrees of success. The handheld games, though, continued on stylistically from the phenomenal Symphony of the Night on PS1, combining side-scrolling platforming effortlessly with RPG mechanics, including a level 
travel system, equipables, magical abilities, and, in the case of Circle of the Moon here, this card system. Gotta collect them all, I guess. Set in the year 1830, this game follows a man named Nathan Graves, who is not a Belmont, instead who wants to seek revenge on Count Dracula for killing his parents a decade prior. His master gets kidnapped and some evil forces are at play to revive the evil Count, so it's up to you, wielding a whip that is not the vampire killer, to go kill Dracula. Such a lovely story, 10 out of 10. So good in fact that former Castlevania series head Koji Igarashi declared it non-canon. Now the game isn't perfect. Though it initially has the illusion of having a semi-open castle a la Symphony of the Night, the game is actually rather linear. Not to mention the characters, while fine enough looking have animations that just look a little off to me anyways. Nathan, dude, you should really see a doctor about that. Also, who made the wise choice to not give bosses health bars? This is one of my biggest pet peeves in video games, and doubly so here since it's a feature in other Castlevania titles. And on top of that, the card system, which allows you to combine cards for magical effects, is glitchy to a point that you can use it to nearly break the game. And despite all of this, I had a ton of fun. Once you get the dash and double jump abilities early on, Circle of the Moon becomes one of the most fast-paced Castlevania games out there. I found myself running through areas, destroying enemies, hunting for life and health upgrades along with equipables, feeling not quite like an unstoppable beast. I mean, bosses definitely gave me a bit of trouble, but definitely feeling probably the most in control of any Castlevania game. For the most part. While Nathan here isn't as mobile as, say, Simon Super Castlevania 4, yeah, for some reason we're back to not even being able to whip straight up, moving around and experimenting with abilities is so fun and satisfying that I almost don't care. Oh, and if you don't want to hunt down a GBA, this one is available in the Castlevania Advance Collection that came out a while back. It's on basically every modern console, so definitely track it down and give this one a shot, even if it isn't canon. This absolutely gets a thumbs up from me. Choo Choo Rocket is a puzzle game originally released by Sega for the ill-fated Dreamcast. Famously featuring online connectivity in that version, I somehow ended up with a European and Japanese copy, despite not actually owning an American version. It's weird how life works out sometimes. Anyways, this here is the GBA version. It's pretty faithful to the original. Thanks to the power of the link cable, you can even play it with up to three friends. More than just that, the game is just really fun in short bursts. Guide these mice through a maze without killing them by using a limited number of directional tiles with different stipulations depending on the mode. If you win, then they have to go now because their planet needs them. Pretty simple, pretty fun, even features a stage creator mode and a character maker. I really don't have a ton to say about this one, what you see is what you get, but simple doesn't mean bad, though I am quite annoyed with this pause that occurs right before you beat every level, it's jarring. On the whole though, Choo Choo Rocket really thrives thanks to its simplicity. This one is another thumbs up from me. Monster Guardians is a Japanese exclusive RPG published by Konami. I was only able to get like 10 minutes in here because I really have no idea what's going on. Monster Guardians seems to want to combine Final Fantasy tactics and Pokemon. Kind of. I mean look, it even has Mewtwo. You take control of your Monster Guardian trainer, tamer, or whatever, as you issue commands to your team in each battle. And then they just kind of wander around this isometric field and maybe if they feel like it, they'll attack an enemy. I know there's probably more to it than this, but the language barrier makes this one pretty much impossible to get through. In concept, I love it, and maybe if you speak Japanese and are a fan of Pokemon or the style of RPG or, you know, somehow find an English version, though I'm certain one doesn't exist, you'll get something out of it. As is though, I just kind of left this one scratching my head. It doesn't help that half my playtime was stuck in cutscenes as well. This one gets a meh. This is Super Dodgeball by Atlas. Yeah, the Persona people. And as you may have guessed from that title, this one is a sequel to Super Dodgeball on the NES, though it doesn't feature the Kunio Kun characters who appeared in the likes of that in River City Ransom. The goal here is simple, make a dodgeball team, and uh, climb the rankings by duking it out with teams from around the world to be the very best. I'm usually not super huge on sports games, but I can't think of any other series that's tried to take on, well, dodgeball. I mean, come on, it's the official game of middle school PE classes everywhere. I really love how customizable the whole experience is. Alter starting team formations, difficulty, team stabs, how even your team name. Heroes, that name is weak. Faced awesome power of Joe Mama. 
Seriously though, it's a lot of fun. Probably my biggest gripe is just how short it is. If you're decent at the game, you can go from start to finish in under 45 minutes, maybe even 30. Grand, the customizable options might mitigate this a bit and add some replayability, along with two-player matches being possible via the link cable. This one is really underrated. It absolutely gets a thumbs up from me. Here's a classic game from the Genesis and SNES era, now in the GBA. And good news, this really shows off the GBA sampling capabilities. I really love the sound on this one. As for Earthworm Jim itself, it looks nice, I guess. Jim here can whip his head around, jump and shoot stuff, and know a lot of folks who love this one. But admittedly, I was never really big into Earthworm Jim. Not sure what it is, but I promise it just comes down to personal preference. Maybe it's how windy the stages are, how wacky in 90s law of the humor seems. Like, I appreciate the attempt, but random access isn't my cup of tea. Also, in this GBA version, I noticed some hit detection issues. Like, look at this box here. Need to get on the spring, but nothing will work. But then I died, came back to the section, and oh look, it moves just fine now. While not the best version of Earthworm Jim out there, if you're a fan of the series, you'll likely have some degree of fun here. For me though, and please keep in mind, this is purely personal preference. It's a meh. A lot of folks claim that the GBA is a portable SNES. While well, that technically isn't true, this is a 32-bit handheld compared to the 16-bit SNES, making it more powerful, kind of, I could definitely see what they mean in titles such as F-Zero Maximum Velocity. A sequel to their original game on the SNES, this game takes that overhead Mode 7 racing action and translates it beautifully to the Game Boy Advance. Now it's not nearly as striking as say F-Zero X on the N64, which had come out in 1998, or F-Zero GX, which Sega would make and release on the GameCube two years later. However, it keeps the speed and spirit of the original, and I absolutely adore it for that. Taking corners, finding shortcuts, and zooming around in a hovering race car at the speed of a bullet train is absolutely addicting, even if I'm absolute hot garbage at it. But no matter how many times I lost or exploded, I kept on coming back for more. If you like the original, you should love this one. Compared to the SNES title, Maximum Velocity is just more F-Zero, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. My only real issue is that, as this one is set 25 years after the original game, that means our Lord and Savior Captain Falcon is nowhere to be seen. Still though, this was an easy, easy thumbs up for me. Let's go straight from a Nintendo-made racing game to a Konami-made racing game. This is Konami Crazy Racers, and before Mario Kart Super Circuit, it was the closest thing you'd get to Mario Kart on the Game Boy Advance. And that's okay, because it's a solid racer. The best way I can describe it is, imagine if Mario Kart featured characters from all sorts of Nintendo series besides just Mario. Okay, bad analogy, but this is technically the third in Konami's crossover series YY World, with it even being called Konami YY Racing Advance in Japan. The first two entries in the series, by the way, were on the Famicom and were platformers. I guess that kind of makes us the Banjo-Kazooie nuts and bolts of the series. Thankfully, this one's good. The variety of characters and stages really gives you a good sample of everything Konami was known for in the 90s, from Castlevania to Gunberry Goemon to even Metal Gear Solid. This title is also rather dynamic, featuring a camera that doesn't mind zooming in and out or rotating a bunch, but never in the middle of a race. It keeps things feeling fresh without causing any headaches. Oh, and what's a good crossover game without an anime-esque opening theme tune? Surprisingly though, most of the music in the tracks themselves most relies on the GBA's Game Boy Color style music capabilities, which would be an issue if these 8-bit sounding chiptune remixes of classic game tracks didn't sound so absolutely kick-ass. My favorite is definitely the remix of The Beginning from Castlevania 3, by the way. On top of that, there's also a license system that both involves competing in challenges to unlock more tracks, a shop, and a menu layout that reeks of Windows 98. God, I love it. Never heard of this one before researching this video, and that's honestly a shame. Konami Crazy Racers is an unfortunately oft-forgotten part of both the GBA library and Konami's back catalog. It more than deserves a chance from any classic kart racing fan or just general retro gaming enthusiast. This one was one of the easiest thumbs up to give yet. This is Fire Pro Wrestling. It's a GBA entry in a long line of Japanese wrestling titles that stretched back to the PC Engine in the late 80s. In this game, you, well, wrestle. Pin folks down, kick them in the crotch, toss them out of the ring, fight in a variety of locales and ring types around Japan, I guess prove your dominance? 
This version here was actually the first game in the series to be released stateside, which I think is pretty cool, as I know the series has a bit of a cult following. While the original titles were all created by now defunct studio Human Entertainment, Fire Pro Wrestling GBA was the second entry in the series to actually be made by Spike. And yeah, that's the same Spike that would later become Spike Chunsaw. You know, the Mystery Dungeon people. Fire Pro Wrestling is a series that's still around today, but this GBA entry is decently fun. I am once again hot garbage at it. I know, surprise. And it's definitely not my favorite of the games I covered today by a long shot. I especially mean that since hit detection is sometimes pretty spotty, but it's absolutely an on-the-go wrestling experience I would have been happy with. It's definitely not as great as, say, some of the N64 wrestling games I played as a kid, but it's decent enough to snag a thumbs up for me. So, uh, fun fact. I know it's considered a rather iconic series, but I've never actually played a Silent Hill game. Nothing against Konami's flagship survival horror series, admittedly it just haven't given this genre as much love as it deserves. Period. I mean, goodness, I only played Resident Evil for the first time a few years back. Anyways, play novel Silent Hill is a visual novel adaptation of the original Silent Hill game that was only released in Japan. Being text-heavy and all, you may think that this makes this one an immediate write-off, but no! Just last year, in 2021, the first version of an English patch was released by a group of fans, meaning that this obscure title is now available for a wider audience to experience. This visual novel starts off some very, very compressed-looking cutscenes. Mmm, before Shrek 2 came to GBA, we had this marvel of entertainment. As compressed and crongy as it looks though, it is impressive to see full motion on the GBA, period. Especially for a launch title. Granted, it's not all FMV. The game itself is a mix of still images and the occasional short clip with text overlaid. Gameplay consists of either making basic choices on how to react in an occasional tense situation, or solving a puzzle a la Nancy Drew. There are two main scenarios here, one for Dad of the Year Harry Mason, and the other for Cop Lady Sybil Bennett, as they explore the mysterious foggy town of Silent Hill. For my bits of research, it's basically the first game, and the translation isn't perfect, there's an occasional typo or text wrapping glitch, and I thought this bit early on was kinda funny. Oh, that was meant to be an onomatopoeia? You don't say! While I'm not sure if this is a game for everyone, especially as I know visual novel sums push the limit of what can even be considered a game, this is one I quite enjoyed and that definitely makes me want to give the series itself a proper shot. It's not going to win any awards or anything, and I would definitely take a proper horror game over this style, but for fans of Silent Hill or their survival genre series, or even just visual novels in general, I think there's a good bit of fun to be had here. I'll give it a thumbs up. Fortress is a game with a unique concept and an equally as unique development history. Originally in development for the PS1 Dreamcast by a studio called Promethean Designs, they went under before the game could be completed. Luckily for us, I guess. Majesco Entertainment swooped in shortly afterwards and bought the license, which they then farmed out to developer Pipe Dream Interactive for Game Boy Advance development. In this title, you take control of soldiers from one of four periods in history as you build a fortress using falling Tetris blocks and, uh, I guess from there you just let them duke it out. It feels like there should be a bit more to it than just that, but no, really, that's it. It looks and sounds fine enough, though, I guess. There's a full motion intro sequence, which is cool, I guess. But the game has so little to it and has such an overall sluggish pace that, despite feeling pretty original for a basic tower defense game, it ultimately comes off feeling like an incomplete product. Really, I wanted to like this one. I think it had a lot of potential to be something quite fun in short bursts. As is, though, this one gets a thumbs down from me. Momotaro Matsuri is a Hudson Soft release that never left Japan, and after only spending a little bit of time with it, yeah, I can see why. This game is heavily, heavily based on Japanese culture, which means that I'd imagine a lot of localization teams would just be hesitant to touch it even with a 10-foot pole. And honestly, that's a shame as I think there's potentially a lot on offer here. First off, let's talk about the title. According to a quick Google search, Matsuri means festival, which makes sense as from the moment the game starts, it appears that a huge celebration is being prepared for. As for Momotaro, he's a hero from Japanese folklore, whose name literally translates to Peach Boy. According to legend, instead of being born regularly, he appeared to his parents inside of a giant peach, claiming upon discovery, yes, as a baby, that he was sent by the gods to be their son. Then when he got older, he set off to fight Oni, which are basically demons, and was joined along the way by several animal friends. I'm absolutely no expert in Japanese culture, but basing a video game character off a character from Japanese folklore is definitely nothing new. I mean, Goemon anyone? 
this game, though I really don't understand what's going on, has a ton of charm. The graphics and music kind of remind me of RPGs from the PC Engine era. You know, your Far East of Eden types? And it clearly has a great sense of humor, too. I was also surprised by the variety of situations and gameplay styles encompassed here. Our adventure starts off with an ancient turn-based RPG battle against a Demon King. You explore the overworld in a top-down fashion. There's platforming segments. Oh, and of course, math. I hope you brought a calculator. Now, if I spoke Japanese, this one would probably be an easy recommend? Maybe? However, my ranking system today ranks games of whether or not I think they're worth seeking out and playing in 2022, and thanks to the language barrier and lack of any English patches, this one is just really hard to recommend to my majority Western audience. It's for this reason alone that I give this one a meh rating. This is High Heat Baseball 2002, and uh, it's sports ball, I guess. Nothing against baseball, I actually really love the sport in real life, I'm just not huge on sports games. Unless it's something truly arcadey or special like NBA Jam or Baseball Stars, sports games really do nothing for me. This one especially doesn't do anything to stand out to me either. I mean, yup, that's certainly a basic baseball game, it mostly works. This is solely personal preference, but this one is a thumbs down from me. Iridian 3D has the makings of a truly classic title. There is a unique viewing perspective for a GBA game, being a shoot 'em up from behind the craft POV. It kind of reminds me of Star Fox. It also has a high energy electronic soundtrack that, even on its own, is well worth a listen. Graphically, even compared to later GBA games, it's incredible how good it looks and how smoothly it plays. Seriously, I had zero slowdown at all throughout my playthrough here, and perhaps being so close to being in a league of its own, especially with the rock solid presentation, makes it just that much more disappointing that Iridian 3D, while still fun, doesn't quite make it to those heights. There's a few things that cause this. First off, your ship sprite is huge, and while that's great for orienting yourself and is debatably technically impressive, means that sometimes you're getting shot by things that your ship is literally hiding. It obscures your view, not constantly granted, but often enough to be a problem. Some hit detection is also a little iffy, as is being able to judge where certain enemies are. Again, these aren't constant issues, but they happen enough to make certain hits or even deaths feel like they're out of your control and purely the fault of the game's perspective. And that's a shame because especially in boss fights and the hard difficulty, Iridian 3D can put up a decent challenge on its own. These issues serve no other purpose than to cheapen this experience. It ekes out a thumbs up for me, but like it's a thumb tilted slightly up, you know? Definitely check it out at least once, but your mileage may vary as far as actually enjoying it goes. And like, that can apply to almost any game, but especially so here. Oh, but if you want a really good, more traditional style shmup that still carries this kind of aesthetic, check out its sequel, Iridian 2. It's not as graphically impressive, that just comes with the shift in perspective between the two, back to a more kind of traditional top-down view, but it definitely feels like it's pulling off what it set out to do a bit better. If you're on the fence with Iridian 3D, then maybe hop into Iridian 2. You can't go wrong with a game that lets you change its main theme's composition from the title screen. Damn, this series is weird. Here's a port of a game from, uh, pretty much every platform from the 90s. Now, I never played the original versions of this game, so my thoughts here are strictly based on the Game Boy Advance version. And this is most certainly a video game. I know all this green stuff is supposed to be foliage, but it kind of just looks like someone vomited on the screen. You play as Pitfall Harry Jr., son of Pitfall Harry from, well, Pitfall. You know, the old Atari games. And his sprite is massive. Really expressive too, but perhaps too big and expressive. It feels like the screen is zoomed in way too far on you. Certain obstacles came out of nowhere and certain jumps were just leaps of faith. Not to mention outside of the title screen, there's zero music. Sure, there are sound effects, but no music? Really? Even Pitfall 2 had that, and that was for an underpowered oh. mini grill. On top of that, stages are really windy and labyrinthine, and as much as I really want to enjoy Harry's hunt for treasure, this ain't it, y'all. Pitfall's Road to El Dorado gets a thumbs down from me. I was originally going to write off J-League Pocket as just another sports ball game, but I guess it is a bit more than that. In this game, you don't play soccer so much as you manage a whole soccer team. And being as it's in Japan, it's the J-League. 
From the looks of it, there's a lot that goes on here. Lots of character stats and trading and cool match cutscenes and uh, dialogue. But this game only released in Japan and there's no English version of it. And these words mean nothing to me. If you like foosball and speak Japanese, then maybe there's something for you here. For me though, this one absolutely is a meh. Rayman Advance is a port of Ubisoft's Rayman. Like, the first one. Yeah, before there were Rabbids, there was this guy. The first Rayman game first saw release in the Atari Jaguar of all platforms, though if you played this, it was likely some version of the PS1 port. It features beautiful graphics, enjoyable platforming, and even some decent voice acting, and it's seen release in everything from PSN on the PS3, and the PSP, and of course the PlayStation Classic. The GBA port certainly doesn't look as sharp as the PS1 version. It doesn't sound as good either, what with there being no voice acting and the music sounding very well. MIDI. But this was a Game Boy port of a PS1 game, and honestly it translated really well. Rayman is just a joy to control, and thanks to how the game adapted itself for the GBA's aspect ratio, it feels almost like you get a little more viewing room than its bigger counterpart, at least along the horizontal axis. Through and through, this is Rayman, an easy to pick up portable package. It's not much more than that, but that's fine because it's all it had to be. And I'm more than happy to give this one a thumbs up. Winning Post is all about the exciting Japanese world of horse racing, except instead of racing the horses yourself, you're betting on them, I guess. This is another one that only came out in Japan, has no form of English translation, and that's filled to the brim with Japanese text. My experience here involves stumbling around for 10 minutes, talking with some people, accidentally searching for a link cable, doing two races, and then getting this cutscene here. I have no idea what I did. To be honest, with the sepia filter and all, I can't tell if my horse won or just died. Editing note, so if I ended up winning the game and the horse died, would that be beating a dead horse? I think it's pretty obvious this one is going to get a meh from me. This rating has pretty much just become a catch-all for all these Japanese titles that look vaguely interesting but I just can't figure out, hasn't it? One of my favorite platformer-esque puzzle games is Mr. Driller. In this title, you take control of this kid with a big drill in a spacesuit as you crush through blocks to tunnel through the earth to the bottom of each stage. And it ends up it had a sequel, and its GBA version features really high quality sounding voice acting throughout it. I was not expecting that, wow. As for the game itself, if you like Mr. Driller, that's good, because this is more Mr. Driller. I mean, guess you're globetrotting now of stages vaguely based on different countries, so that's cool. You're still digging, trying not to get crushed, and watching your oxygen levels throughout each stage. There's once again an endless mode, and if you beat any of the main mission stages, you get a credits roll every time. Neat. But yeah, this is a solid little puzzler that's incredibly easy to pick up and play, and by extension to recommend. That's a big damn thumbs up for me. This is Ready to Rumble Boxing Round 2 from Midway. It's the second in the series, following up Ready to Rumble Boxing from 1999, which I've had a chance to play on the Dreamcast a couple of times. Along with the GBA here, Round 2 also appeared on the Dreamcast, N64, PS1, and PS2. Oh, and it's that very rare upper echelon of games that features Michael Jackson. That's the mark of really something special, I think. Anyways, I remember having fun with the console game, and I remember them having a really hyped up exciting vibe, while well, where things get weird is in the fights themselves. Obviously, 3D on the GBA is very hit or miss. Again, this system is known for being a portable SNES, kind of, sort of. So of course, a fully 3D arena seems just a bit too far out of the GBA's wheelhouse. I'm sure the devs tried to use some graphical trickery to make this happen, and it really does seem like effort was put into that, but it just leads to an effect of pressing up and down the D-pad to move the ring around you, and combine it with effectively moving in a 2D plane left or right to fight your opponent, and the whole experience just comes off as choppy and awkward at best. Again, it feels like the devs almost got across what they wanted, but just couldn't get it fully working in time for launch. While the game certainly has its impressive technical elements, I can't help but feel like it's an incomplete product from devs who bit off more than they can chew. Thumbs down from me. I don't know why, but with a title like Easy Talk Chuck Yuen, sorry if I butchered that, it made me think this was going to be based on a Japanese radio show or something. Maybe something like All Night Nippon Super Mario Bros. Instead, this Japanese exclusive title is intended to teach kids English. Can I eat this? And it does this through an RPG style overworld set in a suburban American, I think, home, with elements of point and click adventure games, occasional timing minigame, characters that are completely voice acted in very clear, well enunciated English. Put the salad.
salad on the table. Look, obviously as a native English speaker, there's not much for me here, but if something like this was available in other languages, I would have loved something like it on the GBA as a kid. Now, I don't know if something done this style will make you fluent over time or anything like that, but like Duolingo, I think something like this could be a good place to learn some basics and get your feet wet with a new language, or review if you've already started learning said language. Honestly, I'm giving this one a thumbs up just because of how well it pulls off what it's set out to do. As someone who both has been learning a second language this past year, German by the way, and who finds languages and linguistics really cool, I think Easy Talk Shock Yuen is a really cool game that definitely achieves what it's set out to do. And clearly, people in Japan must have thought so too, because it got five different sequels to GBA alone. Holy crap. This is another one I actually got a copy of as a kid, though not when it was brand new. I actually got my copy of Super Mario Advance here, which is a remake of Mario 2 on NES, the American version, the same day I got a copy of Super Mario Advance 4, Super Mario Bros. 3, which has a title that both rolls off the tongue, and which is a remake of… well you know, it says it right there. I know it's kind of an odd duck, but I always liked Mario 2 USA. Something about getting to throw vegetables at enemies just does something for me. And as it just so happens, Super Mario Advance here is a fantastic remake of that title. Debatably the definitive edition. As an original NES game, you can play as Mario, Luigi, Toad, or Princess Peach, and each one has their own stats and abilities. Most of the time, you either go through stages as Luigi, who can jump super high, or Peach, who can briefly float in the air by holding down the jump button after a jump. Along with being a graphical and RL upgrade over the original, Mario Advance adds a bunch of other little touches that make this version of Mario 2 go above and beyond any other re-release. There's now rather extensive voice acting with every character sounding fantastic, including trans icon Birdo here. There's a new boss in the form of Roberto, and some new mechanics such as giant enemies and these collectible red coins. The cherry on top is that a fully playable version of the Mario Bros. arcade game is also here. No, the one that predates the NES. Mario feels much less stiff control-wise here, levels now have more graphical flourishes to make them stand out more, and thanks to the link cable, even two players is possible. It's easily one of the best games in the GBA, even if it's a remake. This one gets a massive thumbs up from me. I know it's a little odd that there are no completely original 2D Mario games in the GBA. Yeah, between Mario Land 2 and the Game Boy, New Super Mario Bros. and the DS, close we got to a brand new 2D Mario adventure were ports and remakes of older titles. Along with Mario Advance here, which is Mario 2, and the aforementioned remake of Mario 3 that has the same love and care given to it, there is also Mario Advance remakes of Super Mario World and Yoshi's Island. Those aren't as extensive due to being SNES ports, but still welcome additions to the GBA library. For those curious, where Mario 1 is, though it didn't get the Mario Advance treatment, it was playable in two different forms on the GBA. There is a classic NES release, part of Nintendo's line of direct NES ports for the system, which is a no-frills direct port of the game to the platform. Better in my opinion, though, is Super Mario Bros. Deluxe for the Game Boy Color, which adds in a bunch of other goodies as well and extras and arguably could be seen as a direct predecessor to the Mario Advance series. And yes, I love it despite the screen crunch. Thanks to being completely backwards compatible with the systems that came before it, Mario Bros. Deluxe of course can be played on the Game Boy Advance. Yes, that means on top of all these titles, you had the complete Game Boy and Game Boy Color libraries up to that point that you could access at launch as well. But back on topic, I know this was kind of an odd tangent, but what's important here is that the GBA ended up being a great place to experience all the classic 2D Mario games. And that started off incredibly strong with Super Mario Advance. After gushing about Mario Advance so hard, it almost seems unfair to move on to something else. Thankfully though, the GBA version of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 is pretty dang good, even if totally different from the console counterparts. Like in those games, you play as one of several skaters, including everyone's favorite poster child for existential dread, Tony Hawk. From there, you choose one of your totally tubular, totally customizable boards and go off into a stage to perform tricks to try to earn a high score. And that's pretty much it. There's a huge variety of tricks you can do, and though you'll fall on your ass a lot, playing around with different button combinations and timings is really satisfying. Along with the mission mode, there's also a free play mode, which is the perfect place to try to get the hang of things. Obviously, this is a much different beast in the console games, being isometric and not 3D and all. I know some folks would be put off by the controls, and I definitely was at first. The main weird bit is that the D-pad only controls turning left or right and pressing down brakes. 
After playing around a bit though, I got used to it. This is a really unique version of the game that, despite missing licensed music and some of the flair of the console versions, it really stands on its own. It's by far one of the most unique titles I'm covering today for sure, so this is yet another game that has a well-earned thumbs up. Power Pro Kun Pocket 3 is yet another baseball game, and a Japanese exclusive one with a text-heavy story mode at that, which pretty much guarantees this one a meh. Oh don't worry, I have more to say about it than that. So Power Pro Kun is a hugely popular series in Japan. Makes sense, baseball is highly popular there, and this game sets itself apart by being rather wacky and cartoony. It's a less complex spin-off of the Power Pro Baseball series, which is still around today with new yearly releases on the PS4 and Switch. Power Pro Kun was kind of just the Game Boy branch of the series, and there was a lot of it. Across the Game Boy Color, GBA, and DS, between 1999 and 2011, there were 14 different Power Pro Kun games released, and that's not counting a GBA spinoff called Power Pocket Dash that came out in 2006. Yeah, you heard that right, a spinoff of a spinoff. As for the game itself, I mean, if you speak Japanese, I guess the story mode will have something for you. I fumbled around it for like 10 minutes in the menus and finally got into a game and, uh, well, I guess I suck ass at fielding here. But if baseball in the Japanese language is your thing, then sure, this is a good choice. Along with maybe its 13 other accompanying titles, I bet. Top Gear GT Championship has nothing to do with the TV show of the same name. I know someone was going to ask. No, this is instead a sequel to the Top Gear Racing series, best known for the incredible first SNES entry and some of the Amiga games. The OST alone in the SNES version is just so fantastically good. So how does Top Gear GT Championship hold up? Well, it's boring. Seriously, just boring. I had high hopes too. It's based in Japan and starts off with this intro sequence featuring an anime girl. How very Ridge Racer. But it's all downhill from there. When you get into it, it's just so blah. AI is mostly brain dead. The stages feature no music whatsoever. Your car sounds like a lawnmower. The road seems to scroll at a different rate than the stuff alongside it, and it kind of gave me a headache. It's impossible to crash. Oh, and perhaps worst of all, some of these tracks just go on forever. At the very least, it's mechanically sound, I guess, so it's not completely awful. I'm sure if you had this as a kid and had little to no experience with other racers, and you may have fond memories of it, maybe? But I just found it dreadfully dull. This one gets a thumbs down. The only worse thing than a bad game is a boring game. Now this, on the other hand, is actually a pretty decent racer. Actually, I'd call GT Advanced Championship Racing a really great little racer. Like, not perfect, it's a GBA racing game. The lack of analog stick will always put the GBA at a disadvantage for games like this. But this one is really, really solid. To start, we have super smooth scrolling. Cars from 45 different manufacturers. Races that are short but sweet and accompanied by a great quick race mode if you really just have a few minutes to spare. There's a pumping title track and the in-game music just sounds like it came from some long-lost NES title. And yes, that's a good thing. But if you don't care for that style of music, it's fine as well because you have loud-ass car engines. Oh, and you can actually customize your car pretty extensively at that. Few things feel as good as passing someone in a kitted out Honda Civic, or as I ultimately started using a bunch, a Nissan Cube. This is good. Thumbs up. Probably gonna play more of this once this video's done with. Namco Museum is the name of an entire line of collections of Namco arcade games released on, well, everything. There's been at least 12 or so of these, spanning everything from the PS1 to the Nintendo Switch to just getting their own mini console because anything with Pac-Man's face on it will sell. Most of these compilations are pretty good, and you can expect to find all the standard Namco tiles you expect to find in an arcade, and sometimes a bit more. In this GBA version here, for example, we have Miss Pac-Man, Pole Position, Dig Dug, Galaga, and Galaxian. Yeah, no regular Pac-Man here. I mean, Miss Pac-Man was always better in my opinion, especially if you're playing an arcade version of the high speed board added. But I'm still surprised our original isn't here. I guess to make up for that, Miss Pac-Man is the one game on this collection available in two flavors. There's one that blows up the game board and has it scroll while you play. Sprites are sharper there, but the scrolling effect does not mesh well in my opinion. In the other mode, you can view the whole screen at once, but sprites are much more pixelated. It looks almost like you're playing it on an old flip phone, though the actual gameplay is very responsive and not choppy at all. The rest all play really well though. Pole position especially scrolls beautifully, Dig Dug is addicting as always, Galaga is fantastic in short bursts, and Galaxian is okay but not as good as Galaga, which is to say, accurate to the arcade. 
They look and sound faithful, though some of the sound effects sound rather compressed. To use the same analogy again, almost like they're coming out of an old flip phone. No screen options or anything either, but I don't know what I really expected on the GBA. So the games play acceptably well, and weirdly enough, this version of the game later got a re-release via the Wii U eShop. So grab it while you can? Eh. While there have certainly been better Namco re-release compilations before and since, this one is still solid. So I'll go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Oh boy, another game about managing a soccer team. I've made a point of not skipping sports games this time around, as I usually do in videos like this. I promise I tried my best to give a shit about this one. In Total Soccer Manager, you manage a soccer team. I guess a football team for those globally. Kind of similar to that one Japanese soccer game I covered similarly, except in English. And I guess you get what you pay for here? I tried to find some cool fun facts, but even wikis weren't any help here. I mean, I guess it was published by Ubisoft. You can also hop on the field and actually play soccer, and I've enjoyed the occasional retro soccer game in the past. I don't know, this one really isn't doing anything for me. So, Total Soccer Manager is nothing special. As such, it gets a very deserving, unspecial, meh. I was really excited when I first discovered there was a Yu-Gi-Oh game available for the GBA at launch. As a kid, I played a ton of Eternal Duel of Soul, and occasionally got to dabble with some of the other titles. Years back when I was pre-transitioned looked like a stereotypical Redditor, no I won't be showing that, I covered Yu-Gi-Oh Dark Duel stories for the Game Boy Color, and I really didn't care for it. But I figured this was my chance to potentially show off a really good Yu-Gi-Oh video game today, and also show how this card game could be done right. Unfortunately, that's actually impossible today, regardless of this game's quality. Yeah, the first Yu-Gi-Oh! game to come out on the Game Boy Advance was a spin-off title. This is Yu-Gi-Oh! Dungeon Dice Monsters. Damn you Duke Devlin and your devilish dice. Granted, this one was out at launch only in Japan. It would take over two years to get localized and released in the West, but for the sake of my sanity we're playing the later North American version. Still, this is a really interesting take on Yu-Gi-Oh! It's like they've taken the monsters and some of the rules from the card game and combined it with a tabletop strategy game, complete with movement tiles, tokens, and of course, dice. And like some of those tabletop games, matches can go on for a hot minute. Much like Duelist of the Roses on PS2, which you should totally play if you like Yu-Gi-Oh by the way, matches here can last up to half an hour sometimes if not longer. Well, from my inexperienced experience anyways. And if you get together with a friend, a link cable, and a really firm grasp of the rules, I bet you can go way longer than that and have a really, really intense game. What's kind of unfortunate is that the story mode is just a basic grouping of tournaments. The battle backdrops also all look samey, and the battle animations, though cool, perhaps last a bit too long, though you can turn them off. Overall though, this one's just plain fun. You know you're in for a good time when you have an opening sequence involving techno music, anime art, and random Japanese text flying everywhere. Not to mention by eschewing the card game for some other type of game, this title is more true to the original idea of Yu-Gi-Oh! Yeah, the manga was originally about games in general, and the card game didn't become a thing until partway through that. I really like Yu-Gi-Oh, okay? But yeah, if you like more strategic RPGs, Yu-Gi-Oh! or a bit of both, then check out Dungeon Dice Monsters. This one, though I didn't know what to expect at first, has earned a thumbs up. And now let's go on from fantastic fantastical monster fighting to, uh, golf. I know I've complained about golf a lot in the past. Golf courses take up a lot of land that could have been used for literally anything else, just so a few people at a time can hit a ball around. And the game itself is just slow as hell. Not to mention real life golf, you just spend more time walking around doing nothing in the summer heat than actually hitting the said ball around, and yes, this absolutely stems from childhood memories. That said, I've had some good video game golf experiences. I played Golden Tee at random arcades, I enjoy monkey golf. But uh, ESPN Final Round Golf 2002 here? This is just a pretty basic golf game. A well done one, sure, but a pretty standard golf video game similar to other takes on the sport from other similar companies. I have a question for you watching this right now. Do you buy sports video games on the regular? Like is it a yearly thing for you or an occasional thing? I just don't understand the appeal for realistic sports titles. Part of why I like games is being able to do things I can't in theory do in real life. You know, like drive a Honda Civic. I mean, on a basic round, Golf Faux 2 is fine, it's functional. I think the 3D overview of each hole that you get before teeing off is really cool from a technical perspective. 
but still, nothing really stands out enough to me to get any better than a meh here. Well, okay, except for maybe the soundtrack. That OST is way better than it has any right to be. This is Tweety and the Magic Gems, a party game based on the animated characters from Space Jam. It's a party game and predates Mario Party Advance by nearly four years. So how does it fare? Uh, it's a tire fire. Like seriously, it's just not good. All the minigames look pretty much the same, hitboxes and minigames only work half the time, the music all sounds generic as hell, and it just goes on forever. It's awful. It's maybe even the worst game I've talked about today. Probably the biggest crime is just the complete lack of any sort of soul here. Like you ever just play something that just screams cash grab? Well, that's how I felt playing this. Thumbs down. Napoleon was one I knew was going to be a weird one, only released in Japan and very specifically France. Not the whole of Europe or the power region, just specifically France, and only at launch itself in Japan. I could only initially find a way to play it in Japanese and that's kind of a shame as the game is really beautiful. The cutscenes are seriously some of the most well done on the GBA, and the game itself looks fun. It's a real time strategy game that starts during the French Revolution. Yeah, Napoleon here follows the actual story of the actual historical Napoleon Bonaparte, with some liberties I'm sure. It also features a cameo from my favorite billionaire removal tool. It's a real-time strategy game and one I was unfortunately about to write off. Juan told my husband for me that, hey, there's an English patch now. Except I couldn't get that working. So here's the French version of Napoleon, or I guess this is now called L'Ecole de Guerre. Hey, guess whose only knowledge of French comes from a couple of high school classes years back? It's me. That said, I understand enough to get a hang of it thanks to vague memories of said French classes in high school. As such, I was able to get kind of a hang of it. And as it turns out, this game based around using Napoleon's army to expand across Europe, taking over forts and towns along the way, is actually really fun. There's a lot of variety in the scenarios and the types of troops at your disposal and the difficulty ramps up at a nice pace. If you can get past the language barrier, or you know, can get the English patch to work, then definitely try this one out. This is another really unique one, and definitely one I wish got an official release date side. I absolutely enjoyed my time with it, and I'm happy to give it a thumbs up. Penobi Wings of Adventure is a game by Hudson Saw, released not only as a launch title for the Game Boy Advance in 2001, but it also got a PS1 port a couple of years later. That's such a weird time to release a PS1 game. PS2 was already a few years old by then. What makes it even odder is that this one feels straight out of the 90s. Like, it feels like an old school mascot platformer, maybe a bit Rocket Knight-esque as there's a lot of air dashing involved. I originally had low expectations for this one. I'm not sure why, maybe it's art style. This pre-rendered art style was probably chosen to resemble something like Donkey Kong Country, but instead all I could think about was Sonic Blast. And uh, Sonic Blast sure isn't a blast. But I'm really glad I pushed past those mediocre first impressions because really, Kenobi is a really wonderful little platformer. The controls are tight, the stages are fun to explore, if you don't want to try dashing at enemies you can just jump on them Mario style. And it does get more complex than just basic running and jumping and air dashing as you go on. Sometimes you have to hover in the air a bit, sometimes you have to knock into bombs or other obstacles to damage a certain enemy, and sometimes you have basic block puzzles, just to name a few things. Well, definitely not a new favorite, I'm really glad I gave Penobi a shot. This one surprised me, and I'm happy to give it a thumbs up. Mega Man Battle Network was a huge series back in the day. And also, hey look, Jamie's talking about Mega Man again. Now if only Sonic Advance was a launch title, right? So if you played Battle Network 1 back in the day, you're probably shouting at the screen right now, hey asshole, that wasn't a launch title. And technically you're right, Mega Man Battle Network only launched alongside the GBA itself in Japan. I feel like there are better deep dives into this title and why it's held up so well by other YouTubers, but after recording some footage for this video, I actually went through and finally beat this one. I actually did this set segment alongside a recent video I did on Mega Man Network Transmission for the GameCube, and I'm happy to say that I finally played a Battle Network RPG, you know, not a platformer, from start to finish, besides the excellent later Battle Network 2. So this first game is pretty basic in comparison to some of the later entries, but still really great. You play as Lan Hikari, who lives in a world where the 90s version of the internet has come to life. To navigate this world where everyone has a smart fridge or a smart oven or whatever that can access the internet, people have semi-sentient online companions called Navis. 
think of them like me's that live inside a PDA. Speaking of PDAs, this is your main way of interacting with your Navi and other web-based things. The PET, or PET as I call them. The game is a vibe between two main overworlds. There's your main real-life overworld, where you control Lan as he interacts with his friends and real people. And then there's the internet, where you control his Navi, the titular Megaman.exe. Battles are probably my favorite part of the game, and that's good because there's a lot of them. You fight on this grid where you can move around and shoot at enemies. After a little bit, this custom gauge up here will fill up. When it's ready, you can bring up this menu using the LRR button where you can select a hand of battle chips. Now, you can't select all of these at once, you can only select battle chips of the same type or letter, but the battle chip system is truly the name of the game here. Your hand is pulled from a pool of chips you keep in your chip folder. A good analogy is to think of this like drawing a hand in a trading card game, with your folder being your deck. You can find and obtain chips by deleting viruses, which are main enemies in battle, or by beating bosses and doing other such RPG things. And it's really, really good. Mega Man itself has a degree of custom ability and upgrade ability, the chip system is great and really makes this one stand out on its own from other RPGs of the era, and the internet looks truly 90s-tacular in the best ways possible. And this world is brought together by a great Mega Man tier soundtrack. And that's all there is without going into the exciting world of multiplayer battles. The only bit that feels a little generic is, well, the plot, funnily enough. Exploring each area is basically just an excuse to find and fight a boss Navi, which replaced your traditional Mega Man Robot Masters. Everyone you beat advances the plot, and hey, big plot twist for all you Mega Man fans out there, the big bad is Dr. Wily. Except this game is an alternate universe, so instead of Dr. Wily being a disgruntled roboticist, he is a web terrorist who heads an organization called the World 3. He has to know that it looks like WWW, but it's pronounced World 3. But yeah, this is great. I'm happy to end this look at the GBA launch titles on a high note, especially with such a beloved title. This one absolutely gets a thumbs up. And if you're sold in it now, then I have some good news. There is a good few ways to play Mega Man Battle Network nowadays. First, in 2009, it got an updated, granted Japanese exclusive, remake on the DS called Mega Man Operate Shooting Star. Along with bringing the original game to the DS, it also had some crossover content with the then new Mega Man Star Force series, which I've still never played. But hey, a couple years back it got a fan translation, that's really cool. Also, I know this storefront is shutting down soon, but the original Battle Network game is also available on the Wii U eShop. But don't be upset if you missed your chance to get it there, because the Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection, as of the making of this video, is out next year on most modern platforms. That contains all of the mainline GBA Battle Network titles too, and is likely going to be the definitive way to dive into the series. Damn, that was a lot of games. But now let's get back to the topic at large. This video was, quite frankly, massive. Probably the biggest non-documentary project I've ever done the channel. And one thing I've left out so far is a proper tier list. So if you want a bit more of a breakdown of where I stand on all 36 launch titles covered today, along with Super Monkey Ball Jr. because that was my first, here's a look at a tier list. You see it? Take a good look, because it's going to go away right about now. Oh hey, did you know the Super Game Boy technically had a launch title? For those out of the loop, the Super Game Boy was a funky looking cartridge for the SNES to let you, well, play Game Boy games. It's kind of in the name. And no, it's not emulation. This cart has a whole Game Boy shoved in there. Games play slightly too fast, sure, but you get custom color palettes, fun borders you can even draw on, and compatibility with like 99% of the entire original Game Boy library. And, uh, you can also play all those backwards compatible black cartridge Game Boy Color games, and some even have their own unique palettes. Any other Game Boy game won't work, so no Advance, obviously, or Color games, and there's also unfortunately no Link Cable support. Though a revision with a port, called the Super Game Boy 2, was later released in Japan, complete with a sexy translucent blue cartridge shell, yum. However, the Super Game Boy had further tricks up its sleeve. Some games had custom voice clips when played on the SGB, some had full Game Boy Color-esque color palettes, and even full-on game-specific borders loaded into their cartridges. And all of these, again, were only accessible through playing these titles on the Super Game Boy. You could tell which ones were which by the sole Super Game Boy marker on the box. 
Probably the most insane example of a game with SGB exclusive content was the Game Boy port of Space Invaders. This little cart included a full-on SNES enhanced version of the game on the cartridge, alongside the regular Game Boy version. Yeah, this SNES enhanced version was incredible. I mean, it's still just Space Invaders, but you've gotta appreciate their gusto. To show off the Super Game Boy at launch in 1994 though, Nintendo had something special up their sleeve. Donkey Kong. Though this was the era of Donkey Kong Country, Nintendo decided to dedicate time and resources to what at first glance appears to just be a Game Boy port of their old arcade title from the 80s. However, this game, referred to by many affectionate fans as Donkey Kong 94 nowadays, is much, much more than just an arcade port. First off, the Super Game Boy colorizes the game, adds voice clips, and this gorgeous arcade border. Seriously, love the presentation. Second off though, you ever play Mario vs Donkey Kong? You know those puzzle platformer games that later became outright puzzlers? Following on from the Donkey Kong arcade game story-wise, featuring best girl Pauline, and that many think actually started on the Game Boy Advance? So that series actually technically starts here. After you get through the first four stages based on the arcade game, the game opens up and you get to go through a hundred new stages. And most of these you play as Mario as you collect a key to unlock a door and exit the stage, or try to. But there's so much more than just that. There'll be paths to draw, ladders to build, platforming to do, conveyor belts to deal with enemies to smash, and even an occasional fight against the big ape himself. But what makes DK94 truly special is how Mario himself controls. Handstands, triple jumps, flips and twirls, and sure, falling from certain heights will outright kill or damage you, I swear this is maybe the best Mario has ever felt in 2D. Just imagine Mario's moveset that would later appear in Mario 64, and that just perfectly translated into 2D. Though I guess, since this game predates Super Mario 64, it's probably more accurate to say that Mario 64's Mario moveset was a 3D translation of Mario's moveset here. What I'm saying is the game is good. It's on the 3DS too, so get it while you can, though only in black and white there. And if worse comes to worse, well, uh, hoist your flag, mateys, I guess. For the purposes of legality, that last bit was a joke. But yeah, DK94 is great, and I'm glad to know that, in general, more people have been learning about this game's existence and giving it a shot over the past few years, especially since some Call Me Johnny did his video on it recently. In the circles I'm in online, at least, it doesn't seem to be the so-called hidden gem it once was, and that's a good thing. And if you haven't played and are a fan of Mario or puzzle platformers, then perhaps take some time out of your day and try out Donkey Kong 94. Wow, the Game Boy line had some great games.